Ladies and gentlemen, I have a long-term condition, and it's called optimism. And I'm very excited, particularly around Scotland at the moment, because I think Scotland is the most exciting country in the world at the moment. I'll tell you why. It's because people are beginning to feel they've got significance. People are beginning to feel that when they cast a vote, it actually counts for something. So I'm going to talk about three things. One is, how do we give people this significance? Because you don't have it, things start getting eroded from your self-esteem. Your personality begins to reshape itself. The second thing I want to talk about is creativity. Just now, we are at the start of what I see as a revolution. And it's not just about technology. Technology will change the world out of sight. We know that robots are going to be doing operations and robots are going to be taking, uh, doing law as well. So a lot of those cognitive skills are going to be taken over by the computer. But the things that really matter are creativity and social skills. And that's what scientists are now saying. So all of you professionals, you are experts. But there's something that can be quite tyrannical about experts. Because experts think they know best. And I've got a different perspective. Because I've been a patient. Actually, I don't like the word patient. Because the, the word patient implies, implies some kind of power relationship with a doctor or a nurse. I don't like the word tenant. I particularly don't like the word ordinary person. Because I don't believe people are ordinary. And I don't want to live in a society where we accept that some people are ordinary and other people aren't. I don't know where this comes from. Perhaps it's just deeply rooted in my early experiences. Let me tell you about one of those experiences before I talk about how creativity can change our world for the better. I was homeless, uh, and it was in 1967. I was homeless in London, and it was a pretty raw experience, and you know, you had to be creative, because every day, or every night, you had to find a different place to sleep. And you had to be extremely creative about it, because you needed some warmth, you needed shelter, you also needed some companionship. And I learnt an incredibly valuable lesson, not being in the streets, but by the first intervention that came to try and help me. And this is what I'm talking about, significance. I was picked up by a charity and taken in a van to this hostel. And they promised me that the next morning I would be given some accommodation and some support. But the first thing that happened to me in this great big building in Peckham was that I was taken into this room and I was told to take my clothes off. And then I found myself being hosed. It was delousing spray. And I thought then, I want to go back in the streets because I had more dignity. I had more significance in the streets. And it's true, because I felt that size. And I think our purpose is to inspire people and to empower people to feel that size. Well, not that size, literally. <laughs> you see what I'm doing here? It's a scale thing. Uh, and now, let me tell you about a couple of ideas that really impressed me. One is, and these are challenges that we face daily. And I think there are things around us that make us feel miserable. Let me tell you what I think they are. One is the words that we're presented with daily. We're in the world of warnings and instructions. Do you agree? And one of the things that we're always instructed is around speeding. Because what happens is if you pass a camera and you have to be going over the speed limit, it catches you. We've got this this battle between the motorists and the authorities. And the authorities are trying to get as much money as they can from the motorists. They're not really serious about stopping speeding, because if they did, they would think of other alternative approaches. Here's one, and it came from a 17-year-old in America. And it's been piloted. In fact, it is now in Stockholm. It's embedded in Stockholm. And it's the speed lottery camera. Have you seen this? It works like this. If you go under the speed limit, it says, congratulations, you can enter for the lottery draw. If you go over the speed limit, you pay into the lottery draw. So you know that speediness comes down by an average 22%. That's extraordinary, isn't it? So we sometimes keep going, doing something that is not working. And whenever we find ourselves with that kind of challenge, we have to change what we do. There's a guy, um, oh, it's a runner. Has anyone been to Tirana? 
uh, go now. It's a brilliant place. But it wasn't a brilliant place 10, 15 years ago. Post-Soviet grey. It was dire. And this guy called Eddie Rama, he's 37, very charismatic. He was an artist who ran for political office. He's now Prime Minister, which tells you that he's quite popular in Albania. And Eddie Rama went out and he actually spoke to people. And he listened to them. And what they wanted more than anything else was more colour. And they wanted their civic spaces cleaned up. And they wanted greenery. Don't we all want that? Hmm? So what he did was he created a palette of colours. And if you look at pictures of Tirana now, you will see that the buildings have been coloured. They've planted 53,000 trees. And they've cleaned up the civic spaces. Do you know what the impact is? Crime came down quite dramatically. Civic pride went up. And self-esteem went up. And this shopkeeper who used to draw down the shutters every night in his shop, he stopped doing it now. He says, there's no point. Because there's no crime. That's extraordinary. Using colour rather than penalty. Incentive is a far better way to get someone to do something than penalty. But let me tell you about the language we face every day. Governments have policies. And in Scotland, I think we've got a good policy environment. I think if you look at the policies, there's nothing wrong with them. What happens, though, is the implementation of those policies. Because those same words come down to the front line. So people are faced with words like social inclusion, financial inclusion, digital inclusion, tenant scrutiny panels. These are hideous descriptions. Because, and I heard this from a little boy in the high school in Edinburgh who said, I'm socially excluded, Mister. <laughs> right? If we are telling young people they're socially excluded, that's not the right message. Because the right message is, you are valuable. You are significant. You've got talents. You've got ideas. And we will listen to those ideas. Do we consult children enough in designing our services? We don't. But children are incredibly creative. I know because I ask children all the time. And they come up with solutions that we haven't thought of because they haven't shut their minds. They don't take the same route. In fact, a child doesn't walk like you and I. A child will skip, avoid the cracks in the pavement. A child will walk backwards, they'll walk on walls, and they'll pick up a tiny little glistening object between the cracks of the pavements. And then mum and dad will say, put it down, you don't know where it's come from. Actually, I do know where it's come from, says the child. So when we've got this creativity at its very height, that's when we should be involving children in designing our services and in shaping their communities. There is this expression, children are our future. And I don't like that expression. Because yes, they're our future, but they're also our present. Who would you get to design a playground? A children's playground. <laughs> children. Yeah? In America, they got children and they asked them to design the perfect playground. And children, being children, got down to it straight away. They didn't say, where's the budget coming from? <laughs> they didn't say, I think we've got a resource issue. And they didn't say, we've got 175 gram cartridge paper and this special type of acrylic paint. In fact, they would have used your lipstick. And they created this beautiful playground. Then they did a professional designer in to work with the kids to say, well, a few special things here, but we love the playground you've created because it's what you want. And he said, there's a few things. I would move these two um, pieces of equipment apart because if you come down the slide, you don't want to bump into someone in a swing. Actually, the children did want that. Let's be honest. <laughs> but then they brought in engineering students from a nearby college. Now, this is collaboration. So what they created, ultimately, was a playground that used kinetics so that every time a child used it, it generated electricity for the local community. Now, that is creativity. That is creativity. And sometimes we see a challenge and we see no way around it. So we keep doing the same thing again and again. I don't think the health service, by the way, is responsible for the nation's health. I think we're all responsible for the nation's health. Because the health starts with a person's sense of themselves. And when we talk to people as if they're a problem, 
then they erode what little self-confidence they've got. Do you agree? Yeah? But we do it all the time. We do it all the time. And the experience sometimes that we create for people is we know this, it's not a good one. Waiting rooms are stark. People waiting. Gatekeepers that stop people. They look as if their job is to stop people getting help. Then you go to your doctor's surgery and you go to the waiting room and mine's got Yachting Monthly's piled up. Now, in this particular demographic, it's quite an inappropriate magazine. I'm a doctor's <laughs> going to kill me for this. But all over the walls are all these posters telling me what diseases I haven't yet got. <laughs> so that my imagination is sparked. I go in with a common cold and I come out thinking I've got Ebola. Right? <laughs> That's what we do to people. Think about the inadvertence communications that every day confront us. Now, this is where creativity comes in. Because I believe we can do lots of things. And here are some ideas apart from children. Right? Um, one is, why don't we paint shop fronts where they're empty? And then I thought, that's a brilliant idea. Then I discovered they've actually done this in an area called Columbia in Seattle. That the residents got so fed up of not having, the market didn't deliver shops. The market doesn't deliver shops to every area. But what they did was they painted the fronts of the shops, an ice cream parlour, uh, a hat shop. I don't know what comes to a hat shop would have in Edinburgh or Glasgow, but there it was. And then a few months later, they started to get businesses interested. They've got a delicatessen, they've got a community uh, gallery, and they've got a little bookshop, right? By painting, by using colour, by doing simple things. Other children have said to me, this is in Fife, why don't we have street games etched into the pavements? Why don't we have the names of children born into this community etched into the walls? Why don't we have jokes put up there? Why don't children this size uh, spend much more time with older people? And by the way, it's a brilliant chemistry, isn't it? And there are now more projects where little children are spending time with much older people in care homes. What happens is the older people help the little children learn to read. And the little children bring joy to the older people. They tell stories about their life today. And they show older people what an iPad is and how you use an iPad. And the older people tell stories about their life. I was in one care home uh, in Berwick, and I was being told by a member of staff that her little daughter came in one day, and she loves coming to the care home. And she was passing this woman who was sitting in a chair. The woman went, Psst. She turned around and she says, have you heard about the Titanic? And this little girl says, yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio, she says, well, I was on it. It was actually a lie, but, <laughs> but she, told, she told this little girl the story about her experience on the Titanic, what kind of food they were served, what the dining room was like, what the third class was like compared to the first class. And the little girl went back to school and she told everyone. And it became the school project. And they had to bring all the kids in to speak to this older woman <laughs> to hear about the Titanic. Now that is imagination, isn't it? That is what we've all got. We've got this immense power and influence. And you know, what we should be teaching people to do in every frontline service is to bring that imagination. We've got processes. I'm a rule breaker, right? If a process is constraining doing the right thing, then that process shouldn't be there. We should change our language because, you know, we are not health experts. We are patients, apparently. But actually, I know more about my body than my doctor does. My girlfriend knows more about my body than my doctor does as well. And by the way, back to David's point, I had my first kiss in Kirkcaldy. <laughs> Is Kirkcaldy on the happiness map? It certainly wasn't then, because I got asked to leave school when I was 15. So I was cast out as a failure, right? A failure. And it was being homeless, and it was getting a succession of jobs that taught me, actually, I'm not stupid. I just didn't like sitting in a classroom hours upon end listening to someone who had the capacity to turn even the most delightful information 
into a grey porridge. Because that's what it was like. So we've got capacity to inspire people. And when we meet people, we must ensure that our role is not simply to make them feel okay, not simply to provide customer service, but to lift them. Let me tell you about Disney. Because Disney is a great example. Imagine if Disney was to come in and work with a health service in Scotland, in the UK. How different might it be? Let me tell you a couple of things that Disney do that may suggest something to you. One is around the issue of safety. You don't see it written anywhere. But Disney puts safety as its number one value. Disneyland, Florida. It's the number one value. Because if something was to happen to someone, it would be catastrophic for the Disney brand. Right? You agree? But nowhere do you see the words don't, warning, caution, safety. Because they do the little things to ensure that those risks are removed, but not within sight. So there's a Tower of Terrors, for example, uh, where if you're under a certain height, you're too small. Because health and safety have said you're too small to go to this tower. But Disney don't say, uh, excuse me, you're too small, making the child feel even smaller. Disney work it differently. They say, how would you like to go on a tour that your mum and dad, your big brother and your big sister can never go on? And every child says, yes, of course they do, don't they? So they take them this tour so the child feels special. The child does not feel it's been barred from something. And then when they come back, they measure the child. When you reach this height, they turn the measuring into a bit of a fun ritual as well. Then they give them vouchers and say, when you reach this height, come back and bring your family. That's how you turn a risk into an opportunity. Yeah? The other thing that Disney does, does, it, does anyone know what the, the most frequently asked question at Disneyland Florida is? It is where's the toilet. I thought everyone would have guessed that. <laughs> and by the way, that was the first question I asked when I arrived at Queen Margaret University today. <laughs> I'm at the stage now where I'm looking through estate agency windows and I'm thinking, I want a toilet with an ensuite bed. <laughs> That's an <interesting. laughs> But Disney, the second most frequently asked question is, where's Mickey Mouse? And the third most frequently asked question is, when is the three o'clock parade? <laughs> yes, we laugh. But the danger is that Disney laughs as well, or rolls their eyes. But they don't, because they realise that people aren't actually asking, when is the three o'clock parade? People are really asking, where can I stand? Where is the best place to see it? Where is it safe for the children? And I'm from Scotland, I've got red hair and freckles, and it's 42 degrees centigrade today is the summer I can have shelter. Right? And the Disney person, the cast member, says to the guest, I've got a brilliant place. I'm glad you asked me that question. The parade is on time today. I know a brilliant place for you to stand. It's in front of the cooling ice cream van. So not only will you get a cool breeze, you'll get shelter from the sun, because I see you're from Scotland, uh, and you get first dibs at the ice cream. Right? So they turn it into an opportunity to make people feel fantastic. So Disney's whole vision is around making people happy. Now I think that every public service should have something similar. Because we have all these encounters, and these encounters can belittle people, like my experience when I was homeless. I really felt betrayed by this charity. Because I didn't see my biggest challenge is getting a home. My biggest challenge was to feel that I was relevant, that I had value, that I was significant, that I had stories to tell, that I had a background, that I even had ambitions. And across Scotland just now, there is a upsurge in ambition. Things are changing. We've got to grasp that opportunity now because the opportunity will pass. The opportunity is to think far more creatively about how we address some of the challenges and how we work across sectors. We need the business sector working with the NHS. We need the NHS working with housing people because a home is where people live. It's a fundamental part of their health and their well-being. And we need housing people to work with social care people. And so it goes on. 
We heard earlier about the extraordinary uh, reduction in child deaths in Bangladesh. Let me tell you how that happened. Because it wasn't just about health professionals. There's a guy called Professor Muhammad Yunus. The other Professor Muhammad Yunus, he set up the Grameen Bank. It's a microfinance bank. And he went to all of the big conventional high street banks and he said, I've got this idea. And they all said, eh, it will never work. You'll never get people to pay you back. He's got the highest repayment rates of any bank in the world. Because the conventional banks get less money paid back to them than the Grameen Bank. And what he did was he said, I want to give small loans to women. Why did he choose women? I think he chose women in the same way as I choose women for a lot of responsibilities. Because I think women are incredible. And if you want uh, to get someone to run a budget, get a woman who's been brought up in a housing estate with three children who has managed to feed them and bring those children up to have hope about their future. That is budgeting. Right? So, we have poverty, yes. But I want to focus not on the poverty, but on the new kind of richness that we can create. The human spirit is extraordinary. Where was I? Where was I? I get, I mean, maybe, maybe I've got early stage. Yes, yes. But the point here is that we have the possibility to change this country forever. That we should have no environment that is grey and beige. Because we've got huge areas where people wake up in the morning and they look outside and they see, you know, scantily clad green spaces. Yeah? What they want is trees and they want flowers and they want adventure. And in Finland, and I noticed in Manchester, they've now got a playground in North Manchester for over 75s. I don't qualify yet, but I might sneak in there after midnight just to try us out. That's brilliant. And they've now got playgrounds that have videos inside these little um, containers that move about. The children have to, have to cycle. They have to be active. Because children want to be active, don't they? That is their natural instinct. But our response is stick them in front of the telly. Isn't it? We want neighborhoods where there is color. We want neighbors, when you walk out your front door, you're still in your home. The home is extended into the neighborhood. We need people in those areas to start directing the future. Because the best ideas I've heard have been in local communities. The best ideas I've heard have been inside organizations. It is not the director or the managers that have these ideas generally. It is people that are experiencing day-to-day -day life in their role. And if you live in an area, and by the way, this was the answer I was given. It was a part of Easter House. And this is a few years ago. And I said to a room, there was quite a number of people in it. I said, can someone sum up what life in this estate is like? And this woman, she was quite old, quite elderly. And the room stopped. It went silent when she spoke up. And she said, well, son, See if you're wanting a suntan or a lawyer. Fucking brilliant place to live. See if you want a banana. You've got to get a bus and go down the road. And I thought that was a brilliant summary and I went out. It's true. The market decides that even some of our worst estates are parties of suntan and these glistening suntan parlours in Glasgow and a criminal lawyers. They have to go up the road for a banana. Now, why can't they set up their own store in that area? Why can't they take on the supermarkets? Can they? Yes, they can. This has been done in different parts of America now. And actually, there's a few rural areas in Scotland where the local community runs the shop. And the local community takes a profit from the shop. So there is no challenge that we face where there is not an answer if we use a bit of creativity. So, Please go from today, and whenever you come across a challenge, or you want to do your job even better, you will to make more of an impact. Think of a thousand different ways of doing it. A child will come up with lots. Ask children. Children are not just the future, they are the present. Thank you very much indeed.